thank you. Um, and thank you to uh, all of you who are here on, on the day. And I, I'm assuming you folks were the ones who couldn't get tickets to Guns N' Roses, right? <laughs> That's why you're here today. Uh, Tom did a lot of the thank yous that I'd like to uh, second to uh, good people and also a shout out to some of my former students who are here today and a lot of friends in the audience. Um, I have a big fat paper that I'm going to try to leave sections out. And one of the advantages of being sort of late in the program is that a lot of the material that I have in my paper has been touched on and I can leave a good portion of that out. So bear with me if I'm having to scrutinize some of my, uh, my paper that I have in front of me. Uh, but it's a topic, uh, a different way of looking at the kind of the big picture of uh, reconstruction in Arkansas is to look at it through the lens of political violence. And that's what I want to do, kind of going back to the beginning of Reconstruction and as my title indicates, I'm going to take it a little further than the traditional date uh, that ends Reconstruction in Arkansas in 1874. The Civil War split the white population of Arkansas into two sides and it highly politicized soldiers and common folk. Lacking government in much of the state and desensitized to violence by war, many soldiers and civilians became accustomed to the use of force to solve their problems. Yet after 1865, these enemies had to live together in the same communities. Reconstruction became a prolonged period in which Arkansans used illegal violence to get, preserve, or increase their power. That's basically a definition of political violence, violence used to get, preserve, or increase power. White elites who had supported the Confederacy and their children afterwards battled a tenuous alliance of a few newcomers, we could call them carpetbaggers, uh, larger numbers of poor whites, many of whom who had fought for the Union, and then for freed men and women. Much of this violence played out on the local level with competing groups fighting over control of county governments. A lot of the scholarship, in fact, probably most of it, and a lot of what we've heard about today concentrates on the state government, you know, the governors, and the, this is a pretty dramatic and interesting story. A lot of what I'm going to talk about looks out in the whole state of Arkansas and see how there was competition broadly in different areas of the state. Um, Using political violence then as the lens, I'm going to argue that Reconstruction did not end in 1874, but it continued until these tactics of violence brought victory and total domination for one side over the other. The full deconstruction of Reconstruction did not occur until the disfranchisement of African Americans and some poor whites in the early 1890s. White elites then could put away their guns because they wouldn't need them to rule anymore on the state or local level. Um, the first three years after the Civil War were actually a fairly tenuous time of peace in, in the state, you know, because as has been uh, said already today, uh, former Confederates basically moved in and ran the state, state government uh, to down to local government. Tom has said uh, that um, in one of his books that uh, they were ready to get back through the ballot box what they had lost on the battlefield, and they did that. You know, 1866, basically, uh, former Confederates are going to dominate the state legislature of Arkansas, uh, and they're going to um, um, extend that control down into county governments all over the state. This is just a slide that kind of reminds you the spirit of things uh, as the war's ending uh, in um, 1865. I actually have a very little text, but some pretty pictures in my PowerPoint um, to look at so you don't have to look at my bald head uh, up here. But that, of course, changed. As we've heard today uh, in 1867 with the Military Reconstruction Act, the Congressional Reconstruction, replacing that soft reconstruction policy of uh, um, President Johnson, things are going to dramatically change uh, in the South and certainly here in Arkansas in 1867. Uh, we're going to have this fellow still being the governor of Arkansas, the 
uh, governor who was elected in 1864, Isaac Murphy, you know, he had been the only dissenting vote against secession back in 1861. So in 1864, they're looking for the Republicans or Union Army, looking for somebody to be a governor of Arkansas. He'd be a good candidate, the only person that to the very end did not vote for secession. So he's governor uh, in these years, and even into 67 and 68, as uh, Jay had said, he doesn't come up for re-election until 1868. But things are tremendously changing uh, in 1867 when the um, Military Reconstruction Act begins to take hold. And then we have um, uh, the Constitutional Convention in 1868 that's going to set things up for a whole new situation. And then this governor you've heard a lot about already, Pal Clayton, will be elected as the ninth governor of Arkansas. And that's going to tremendously change things uh, immediately. Um, to conservatives, and by 1867, I think we can start calling them Democrats. Uh, Jay talked about some of the issues of terminology. They didn't want to use that term. But by 1867 and 8, they're organizing officially as a Democratic Party. So uh, I will, I'll call them Democrats. And always keep in mind that we use the terms Republican and Democrat they have very little to do with what those parties mean uh, today. Um, so the conservatives began, or Democrats began immediately to respond to losing out radically here in 1868 when Pal Clayton becomes governor. Uh, and one of the first things he does is he just basically sweeps out all these uh, uh, Democrats or former uh, Confederates who were serving as county judge and sheriff in these counties all around the state and appointed Republicans who are mostly Union soldiers, and most of them, many of them white Unionists in the um, uh, Ozarks and the Washington Mountains, and then even uh, quite a number of, of African Americans on the counties uh, in the Delta and so forth. So it's a total turning upside down of who's controlling uh, the political system in Arkansas when Pal Clayton comes uh, into power. Often it's looked about looked at as this change is happening in Little Rock, but it's really rippling out to impact people all over the state of Arkansas. Immediately uh, when this happens, uh, organized armed resistance comes through the Ku Klux Klan. It had been founded in Tennessee in 1866, but by 1868 it had been reworked to incorporate violent terroristic tactics, tactics to oppose Republican rule and black rights. Um, one of the um, a former Confederate Brigadier General, a man named Robert Glenn Shaver, who lived in Jackson County, much later claimed to be the leader of the state KKK, and he boasted that he could, on a short notice, uh, gather 15,000 armed Klansmen to come to fight against the Republicans. Uh, he said that he attended regular meetings of the Klan in Memphis with the Grand Wizard of the organization, the former Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest. Uh, I'm not 100% sure that's true. It's you have to take a, with a, a lot of this material that we're talking about today, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, the fellow that you see there in the middle, lower right with the long white beard, uh, this one right here, not that, his is even longer, isn't it? Uh, that's uh, Shaver, and he made these comments about 30 years after uh, Reconstruction, and so, you know, sometimes older people, I'm getting older. Uh, boast uh, about their achievements of, of the past. So it's just, it, he said it, and uh, it, maybe it's true. Um, but in any case, it's very clear that quickly throughout Arkansas, with, we have evidence almost immediately in Little Rock, Fort Smith, Batesville, Monticello, Pine Bluff, Camden, Searcy, El Dorado, uh, that um, dens of the Klan were um, uh, organized there in the summer of 1868. The Arkansas Gazette, which was intensely partisan towards the Democratic Party, endorsed the formation of the Klans as a way to fight fire with fire. Uh, there was a Klan handbill that was found nailed to a tree in Pine Bluff that announced that, quote, the time has arrived, blood must flow. So the violent intent of the Klan is pretty obvious here. Um, well, disfranchisement for uh, as the, uh, the new constitution of 1868 had done, eliminated political activity by these former Confederates, so uh, perhaps illegal violence was the, the only way they thought they had to pursue their interests. 
Well, during the summer, violence broke out in several areas of the state, and much of the violence was aimed at the most vulnerable supporters of the Republicans, and that would be freed people, as you see in this uh, very famous drawing. This isn't specific to Arkansas, but it would be characteristic of the Klan's activities uh, in the South. Uh, this kind of racial violence was political violence because it tried to change the balance of power, especially by trouncing on the rights gained by people of color with the 14th Amendment. Uh, and I'll give you a few examples. In May, the Klan took a black man uh, out who was sitting for jail in, in, in uh, Woodruff County for vagrancy and just simply hanged him. In Bradley County, bands of men patrolled the roads at night, shooting into the homes of freed men and women. Ten black men were murdered in Union County in August, and Union men there took to the woods, literally sleeping in the woods to avoid prowling bands of uh, Klansmen. Near Louisville in Lafayette County, seven freed men and a white Unionist were murdered on a single day in August. Then from 50 to 75 white and black Unionists in the area were said to be living in the woods, as I had said before. So, and I have several other examples, I'll stop there. Uh, but in general, localized violence of the Klan, much of it against um, people of color. Uh, in Conway County, uh, which is where I kind of started out my study of, of this sort of subject, uh, in August, it almost got to the point of race war. They actually called it a race war, it was about to break out, when some of the former Confederates, and I would presume that they were Klan, were uh, disarming uh, freedmen. And disarming, I can't remember who today has already talked about that. It's one of the codes, really, uh, kind of the hot button issues. Uh, in 1868 is white uh, conservatives felt very uncomfortable about uh, black men carrying guns. And in Conway County, they just took away all their guns. The response was uh, blacks gathered outside the town of Lewisburg uh, and uh, talked about, um, uh, this is Lewisburg around this time. It's what Moralton will become, kind of grow out of Lewisburg, um, right there on the Arkansas River. Um, and it's a touchy spot because there was a Union garrison in Lewisburg during the Civil War. There was an office of the Freedmen's Bureau there at this particular time. This painting is of Lewisburg done around 1870, but it's by a young woman who's the daughter of the most important uh, Confederate leader. Of, it was a colonel during the war and then sort of prominent man thereafter, Susan Gordon. And she's painting what she thought uh, Lewisburg would have looked like in her childhood. She was born in 1851. But in any case, almost um, a race war broke out until Governor Clayton actually steamed up on a ship uh, to try to diffuse the problem. He had actually sent a uh, representative up to the northern part of Conway County, which had been a Unionist stronghold during the Civil War, actually where many of my ancestors, I grew up in that part of Conway County, had fought for the Union in blue, uh, sent word up for them to, to march on Lewisburg, and some 350 of them were organized, marching on their way to fight it out with these uh, uh, Klansmen in uh, Lewisburg until uh, when Clayton got there, the problem was diffused, and they had to send word to get back up to the northern part of the county, don't come on down, and they apparently were pretty disappointed because they had taken orders for the uh, uh, coffee and dry goods that they were going to bring back after they looted Lewisburg. <laughs> uh, I actually found in the Conway County Courthouse a listing of the pay to this group of people. I found my great-grandfather's name on it. It got paid for trying to come down to fight it out in Lewisburg in 1868. So, um, in general, much of the use of violence by the Klan was aimed against freed men and women to demonstrate how they rejected the rights that people of color gained with the 14th Amendment uh, and the Constitution of 1868. But in real terms, it's just an opening of the same wound that had been sort of papered over in 1865. Really, the same groups that were fighting it out with each other in the Civil War uh, here were just picking their guns back up to, to go at it again uh, in 1868. I have some other examples of similar violence, but I'll move on. Um, when the Klan targeted not just uh, people of color, but they also targeted anybody who represented the Republican Party. So state and county officials, uh, 
uh, representatives of the federal government in the Freedmen's Bureau, registrars who are locally appointed men given the job of going throughout the counties and uh, determining who couldn't vote, who was going to be disfranchised because of their uh, Confederate past. Uh, so all of those uh, folks would be uh, uh, targets as well. This uh, drawing that you see here is a Freedmen's Bureau school being burned. This isn't in Arkansas, this was actually in Memphis, but the same sort of uh, targets um, uh, throughout the state of Arkansas. We just want to have good pictures for them. Um, according to Governor Clayton, Democrats, and we could say Klansmen, drove away registrars in a number of counties in, in uh, Arkansas, Ashley and Lafayette, and uh, they shot the registrar in Woodruff County as he was going out there trying to make his rounds. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau agent in Crittenden County, uh, who was also a state senator, reported that a group of about 90 Ku Klux were trying to take over the county by assassinating lead leading Republicans. Uh, they shot this man through an open window of his office in Marion in Crittenden County at dusk in the center of town. Um, two Freedmen's Bureau agents in Little River County were murdered by a gang of seven men. County Sheriff with the two agents managed to escape, et cetera, et cetera. I have actually about a dozen more examples of uh, Freedmen's Bureau agents, registrars, um, Republican officials who were victims in some ways of this kind of Klan violence. Uh, the most famous example is the one time I men mentioned already of a sitting congressman uh, going with Joseph Brooks to try to uh, settle a fight that was happening in Monroe County. Um, and on their way there, a, a Democrat came out and literally just shot um, um, Hines in the back and, and wounded uh, Brooks. So if you imagine, you know, a sitting congressman uh, basically killed uh, in the kind of political violence there in the fall of 1868. Well, Governor Powell Clayton's answer to this sort of violence, uh, now I want to just remind you, it was mostly aimed at removing um, black voters from participating in the election. This was all preparatory to that November uh, election uh, that was coming up. And Governor Clayton's answer to all this was to uh, use military force. There were federal troops already in Arkansas, 23 different locations in the state, I had federal troops, but it wasn't enough. Uh, Clayton had called in his inaugural address for the organization of a state militia, and the legislature uh, later that m same month authorized the raising of a volunteer militia with the governor of it uh, as the commander in chief of it. Um, and only those who could serve in the militia were the ones who were qualified to vote. So again, it would exclude uh, former Confederates and it would be open to the idea of arming freed men. So again, that issue is there right from the beginning of these militia. Um, and during August, September, and October, Clayton's supporters were out in the countryside recruiting companies of white and black militia. Uh, and again, uh, their attempts even to uh, organize militia were another kind of pretext for Klan violence to fight back at them. Uh, the Klan in Woodruff and Jackson counties ambushed militia recruiters and then harassed some of the black militiamen that had already been uh, raised, uh, including raiding their homes and taking away their weapons. One of the real problems for these militia folk was uh, inadequate weapons. The Klan adversaries usually had better weapons than the actual organized state militia, and a reason for this is that uh, Ex-Confederates at the end of the Civil War generally kept their guns and their horses when the war ended, while, whereas Union soldiers were required to turn in their guns and their equipment. Uh, Governor Clayton recognized the problem and immediately ordered 4,000 rifles, rifles to be sent from New York, but once the rivals got, rifles got to Memphis, uh, there were some local men who refused to cooperate to get them onto Little Rock, and then eventually Clayton had to send a, a ship uh, to uh, collect them from Memphis, but it was, was, as it was coming down the Mississippi River a few miles south of uh, Memphis, a group of Klansmen um, basically ambushed uh, the uh, ship, uh, threw a lot of the guns in the river, and then took the rest. So that one of the problems they had uh, continually was uh, just the problems of inadequate weapons. 
Well, when Election Day arrived in Tuesday, November 3rd, it, it appears that the Klan did, in fact, there's uh, Congressman Himes, I have a few slides behind myself. Um, it, it appears that um, the Klan had, in fact, kept many Republicans from voting. In a state where ex-Confederates had been disfranchised, Republicans won by a majority of only 3,000 votes, as uh, Jay had shown us uh, with his uh, statistics earlier. Uh, only 3,000 votes, uh, and Republicans carried 24 counties to the Democrats' 21 counties. Um, so in, in uh, quite a number of counties, this political terror uh, was so acute that they didn't even count the votes. Later, um, Clayton claimed that threats against registrars caused them to resign and just simply not do any work in 12 counties, making elections impossible. So I think this is the technicality, Tom, that you were uh, asking about why those votes wouldn't actually be counted uh, in the presidential election by, because of these irregularities. But then also there was uh, um, a situation, some of the counties where votes were counted uh, showed almost uh, improbable uh, results, like uh, Randolph County, uh, for example. Um, well, no, let's see. Um, I'm confused here. Let me just skip that and keep going. Um, after the election was over, Governor Clayton declared martial law in 10 Arkansas counties and they were Ashley, Bradley, you can might just visualize them, see if I can get a map of Arkansas up here, where those are. And then again, some of the counties aren't going to be familiar shapes because there's a lot of redrawing of the counties um, in the Reconstruction era. This map comes from 1855. Uh, so that martial law is in Ashley, Bradley, Columbia, Lafayette, Mississippi, Woodruff, Craighead, Green, Sevier, is it? and Little River. And the declaration of martial law suggested that authorities in these counties couldn't carry out their duties without using military force. It was kind of a recognition of what people already knew, that Arkansas was in a state of war, basically, between two sides that had been fighting uh, each other uh, at an early period of time. And then immediately after the election, Clayton puts his mil militia into action. He divided the state into four military districts. Uh, placing the southwestern district under the command of Robert F. Catterson that you see here, and you saw a later picture of him in Tom's uh, talk. Uh, another representative, Daniel Upham, was the commander of the northeastern district, and a state senator, Samuel Mallory, was appointed to the southeastern district. The northwestern district, which contained none of the ten counties under martial law, uh, didn't get anyone assigned to it and didn't see any activity there. Militia units were raised um, in the Northwest and sent to uh, the other three districts. But by November, uh, after, right after the election, there were, uh, the commanders were receiving instructions to military occupy these counties that were under martial law and raise additional militia, through, even through conscription if necessary. Uh, about 2,000 men, who were mostly former Union soldiers from the Ozarks and some freedmen from the Flatlands, served in this militia campaign. Probably black men made up the largest number of the militia. Clayton later complained that at the onset of the expedition, they lacked sufficient arms, ammunition, horses, mules, food, and other necessities, and had to just simply commandeer them as they went. These ragtag troops even lacked uniforms and resorted to trying, tying a strip of red cloth to their hats to designate them as militia. They were given vouchers to pass out to people from whom they took food and supplies uh, to uh, so that they would get paid, but in some cases they never got paid. The difference between, I guess, commandeering and looting was a pretty fine line. <laughs> well, about 350 uh, mounted militia assembled in Murfreesboro in southwestern Arkansas uh, with this uh, Catterson, uh, and one group of them went on into uh, Center Point, about 100 black men, uh, went ahead to center point where they took munitions, arms, and other supplies and held a large group of, um, of people in center point under guard in a field. Uh, as word got back that a force of about 400 Klansmen were organizing to come undo that, 
uh, Catterson and the rest of his militia rushed to center point just in time to fight it out. With a, this was an actual pitched battle in, uh, between the Ku Klux Klan and this militia in center point uh, in southwest Arkansas. It's sort of rural Arkansas is equivalent of urban warfare, if you can imagine it, because these two sides fought their way through the buildings in center point. I don't know how many there would be there, and um, ended up with the militia routing the Klan. Uh, Catterson took control of one structure from which snipers were firing, and he found it to be the headquarters of the local clan with a Confederate flag-draped altar and costumes hanging from the walls. The militia discovered several men hiding in the attic and took them and about 60 others as prisoners. And from center point, they marched on a route through other south, uh, southern Arkansas counties, uh, ending in Ashley County in the southeast. Uh, basically a show of force to, uh, to dispel the influence of the Klan there in uh, November um, and December of 1868. In the southeastern district, Samuel Mallory, who'd never had any military experience, took his three companies of black militia to Monticello, where the Klan had murdered the deputy sheriff the month before. Uh, some of the black troops did some shooting, which um, inspired uh, a lot of the local whites, maybe about 200 white men, to gather and again take away the arms of the uh, state militia. The whites appealed directly to Governor Clayton, asking to be allowed to raise two companies of a home militia to keep order. He said yes, that's a little bit of a surprise move, and the black militia were mustered out of service. But then a few weeks later, Catterson and his men, after they swept through southern Arkansas, arrived in Monticello. He was apparently a man of sterner stuff than Mallory, and he arrested several men, including a Klan leader who had killed the deputy sheriff. They tried and executed the Klansman for murder. The third militia campaign into northeastern Arkansas began in early December when the leader there, D.P. Upham, whom Tom has just called a carpetbagger's carpetbagger, brought his men to Woodruff County. Uh, and um, when Democratic opponents began to gather outside of Augusta, Upham took 15 local people hostage and just threatened to destroy them in the town if they were attacked by the Klan. Uh, so basically, if I summarize, it's just in Community after community, we have, in some cases, even pitched battles between the Ku Klux Klan and the Republican militia uh, representing uh, Arkansas. Let me go back to Conway County for one last little militia Klan uh, story, and I'll bring my uh, beautiful oil painting of uh, Lewisburg back up there. Uh, by December, uh, Governor Clayton added Conway County to the list of um, counties under martial law when the Klan there uh, began to uh, terrorize uh, people of color, killing uh, one man, white man, who lived with a white woman. Apparently, again, um, miscegenation, interracial relations, uh, another hot button like owning of arms uh, that the Klan targeted. A locally organized black militia in Lewisburg responded with an attack on two Klansmen that they found in a cane thicket killed one, and then they moved on to the home of the man that they thought was the leader of the Conway County Klan, Thomas Hooper. They carried him off with his hands tied to a horse and a rope around his neck. His body was found the next day with a gunshot in the back of his head. Well, the Klan responded to this by burning down a hotel in Lewisburg um, that was owned by the captain of the militia company. Unfortunately, the flames spread and destroyed another store, two saloons, and the post office. That's, I'm guessing, why Susan Gordon painted the picture of what Lewisburg used to look like, because by the time she painted this, half of the town had been consumed uh, in fire th from this clan and uh, militia violence. Um, Democrats yelled at the time about the harshness of martial law and would complain for years about these criminal outrages by militiamen. And certainly there are plenty of pieces of evidence uh, that uh, support that. I'm going to not go into a lot of that, but there's evidence that uh, atrocities were committed on both sides. But I think just a takeaway from this is, is what would be striking about it is how effective the work of the militia was in um, stopping the Klan, and, and, and they generally scattered in, in the face when the militia arrived, the Klan generally uh, ran the other way, or when they had pitched battles, they lost. Um, 
there's evidence that the KKK actually even caved organizationally in the th with the threat of force. In Memphis, the um, uh, leader of the Crittenden County clan was arrested, a major Joshua or Josiah, I'm not sure which is his first name, Earl is his last name as in the community of Earl just a little bit east or uh, west of Marion. And they found in his possession a letter indicating that the clan was ordered to be disbanded throughout Arkansas on January 29th, 1869. Again, just a measure of the uh, efficacy of the use of clan. Uh, of violence against the Klan. The historian of the Reconstruction Klan, a guy named Alan Trelease, has argued that Clayton did more than any other Southerner, Southern governor to suppress the KKK. Um, so when Arkansas became pacified, by early 1869, martial law was uh, pulled from all those counties where it was uh, held uh, by early 1869. It would seem like, you know, this previous four or five months had been just a sequel uh, to the Civil War. Okay, well between 1869 and then this uh, Brooks-Baxter War that we've been hearing about, Arkansas is in a general period again sort of of relative peace until all hell breaks loose again here in 1874. That's probably an exaggeration. I, I, there are anecdotal events, stories about um, people picking their guns back up at a moment's notice in Chico County, I think in 1872, in Pope County, a La Pope County Militia War, and Perry County had a blowout in that period of time. So we were never too far from uh, these two sides coming to blows with each other uh, that had been fighting it out now, Civil War, Reconstruction, and then yet again. But then we have uh, this uh, event of the Brooks-Baxter War. I want to revise, uh, suggest uh, maybe a bit of a revision uh, in what we uh, uh, know about the, or tend to think about the Brooks Back Store, because I'm going to argue that it was basically just uh, uh, the next sequel, kind of like the Star Wars, you know, one more time we're going to have it out. Generally, uh, I, like Tom, think that um, this Brooks Baxter War is it's confused and confusing, hence not a lot of th has been written about it. it. It's just darn interesting and important. It's surprising there's not a book about the Brooks Baxter War. There's plenty of material out there, uh, primary source material, newspaper accounts. Um, there's that Harold book that we've just talked about. And then after the Brooks Baxter War is over, a congressional committee comes to Arkansas takes testimony, there's a big, thick, fat uh, book of primary source materials about what had happened, and it's hardly been used. It's called the Poland Report. Um, so it's been understudied, but yet one of the um, kind of prevailing generalizations about it is it's, this, it's about this clash between these two factions in the Republican Party. My suggestion for revision is that the Baxter side was just a proxy for the Democrats because as has been, you've heard today already, Baxter had pushed for the end of the disfranchisement law successfully. Uh, and then in the uh, November 1873 election, Democrats got a majority in the General Assembly. So by November 1873, one could say Reconstruction is half over, you know, because Democrats controlled the General Assembly by that point. Um, and then um, if the other kind of factor I, I maybe encourage you to think about or what I've tried to do uh, with this presentation is to look at the people who are actually coming to Little Rock. If you look at the leaders, the politicians, yeah, they're Republicans, and then even the leaders of the troops are generally Republicans, some of them, many of them carpetbaggers, but if you look at what's happening to bring the people into to Little Rock to fight, uh, like this uh, sign uh, bill that was uh, posted, rally, uh, come to the aid of Brooks, and they were doing the same for Baxter. So this 3,000 uh, or so men who are uh, coming to Little Rock out in the street there, camping on the grounds of this building, and then just down a couple of blocks, down Markham, the Brooks people, who were they? Who were the people? Who were the Indians? We know a lot about the chiefs, uh, but not about the Indians. And I'm not totally original in doing this. There was a, a guy who did a master's thesis at the University of Kentucky that I've seen nobody in Arkansas cite uh, has actually tried to go through the newspaper and different kinds of sources to identify 
where these troops were from and what their race was. And basically what I'm going to argue here is that, yes, there were black troops on both sides, uh, but most of the Baxter troops were white, and they were from areas of the state that were democratic, and the Brooks troops were almost entirely black and from Republican strongholds. So that it's really more a reprise of that same struggle uh, between Democrats who are supporting Baxter and uh, uh, Republicans uh, supporting Brooks, uh, largely through black troops. I think, and Tom has talked about this very colorfully, you know, I'm not nearly as funny as Tom, uh, I can tell already here uh, by the response, but, um, uh, you know, it is dramatic if you imagine these black troops that are brought in from Jefferson County and the brass band playing out there, and that makes yeah, big attention, but they went home after a week. They only stayed in Little Rock, these black troops from Pine Bluff, uh, for a week, and then they went back. Uh, Whites took them back, and then there was that second group of black troops brought by Ferd Havis, who was a, uh, uh, a black political leader in um, Jefferson County. And it's kind of interesting how is it he would support Baxter. He had actually gotten his position as a political appointee by Baxter, which might explain some of his loyalty to Baxter. He raised troops and they came up, but they stayed on only a week and then they went back home. Then all the other reinforcements, the people that are coming, like maybe being brought across to reinforce uh, uh, the Baxter or Brooks people, is going to be on a color basis. I've got a quote here, if I can find it in my, all this paper that I have in front of me. Um, that a week after um, the Baxter, uh, the black troops re arrived, someone said that the troops for Baxter are almost entirely white. And then another newspaper reporter who said that the Brooks men were almost entirely black. Uh, and that was, again, the finding of this uh, um, uh, master student who'd actually looked at, you know, that, that sort of, uh, information in newspapers. I added a little bit to it because he didn't use the Herald book and there's a lot of uh, uh, information in Herald's book about particular groups and where they came from. One other factor that uh, came up in looking at the uh, rank and file is that they generally came from um, certain areas of the state. There was a predominance of the white Baxter troops that came from southwestern Arkansas where these whites had just had it out as the Klan with this black militia. Hempstead County uh, specifically provided more troops than any of the rest of the Baxter folks with uh, different groups coming from his white companies arriving in Little Rock from Hempstead, which is in southwestern, is that where Murfreesboro, was that in Hempstead? Hope, Hope. Hope and Center Point, would that be? Howard. Was there even Howard. a Howard? Howard? It was part of Hempstead then in, um, Severe, okay. Um, so they came from Hempstead on April 18th, the 27th, the 30th of April, May 7th, and May 11th. Um, so uh, black troops came specifically from Phillips, and oh, wait, that's, uh, that's not right, from um, Pulaski County, so, um, uh, well, basically central Arkansas counties that had sizable black community. Communities, Conway County, Perry County, I can't find it in my paper, but I have it laid out there. And then the white Baxter troops came largely from central Arkansas. Conway County sent whites for Baxter, blacks for Brooks. Uh, and then that sort of pattern uh, in central Arkansas, northeastern Arkansas, and southwestern Arkansas seemed to prevail there. I could, didn't find uh, rank and file from the Ozarks or the Delta. The black men of the Delta pretty much just stayed home. Uh, and maybe that's why Fur Bush in uh, Lee County just wanted peace because they weren't keyed up about it. And then in the Ozarks, uh, I didn't find uh, you know much uh, uh, participation, but more of those areas where there were white wanting to have control over black minorities uh, in their uh, particular area. Well, when the Brooks Baxter has ended and we have that constitutional convention, that's, uh, there's going to be an election 
uh, to uh, convene that constitutional convention, um, it's going to take place through um, the same sort of fraud and intimidation. We've heard those words a lot today uh, that had been used in all these other elections. So the, the election that brings the um, people to Little Rock to write this convention, uh, constitution that Rodney's going to tell us about um, is um, um, going to be convened largely through um, fraud, intimidation. I'll give you one example to kind of make that point. In Phillips County, where black voters outnumbered whites by two to one, um, all of the 3,200 recorded votes were for a convention with not one vote against a convention. And any times you have a vote that's, that sounds like Venezuela, doesn't it? Or something, you know, where it's uh, all to one side. We know that there, it's not a fair <laughs> vote that uh, black men of Phillips County would have voted to undo a convention or constitution that protected their interests. But that's the way uh, we have it here. But yet we say at this point, Reconstruction ended in Arkansas. Well, I'm running out of time, but let me just summarize why I would argue that that's not the case. If you're looking at political violence, it's just going to continue to cruise on any time that this tenuous control that white elites have in the Democratic Party, uh, and especially in local areas, is threatened, the violence resumes. By the end of the 1870s in several of the Delta counties, whites, well maybe it's right after the federal government withdrew troops in 1877, the, end, the actual end of Reconstruction from South Carolina, was it another state, Louisiana, Florida, and Reconstruction is over. The very next election, 1878 and 1880, in uh, the Delta, whites thought, we don't have to let these folks vote. And Brooks, uh, Blake's uh, chart that showed uh, black people serving in the legislature, there was that dip in 78 and again in 80, as in uh, some of those counties, the, the vote tallies indicated that uh, disfranchisement had already started. I'll give, use just one example to make the case, and that's in um, Phillips County. Let me go on. Here's a, our Governor Garland at the beginning of redemption in his house. You can see if you want to drive over there today. Um, uh, in uh, Phillips County in 1878, um, Democrats had just determined to uh, undo the black vote. Um, and they did this by uh, going to Memphis and bringing two cannon down to uh, uh, Phillips County and then putting one at the courthouse where people would vote and the other one they just rolled around in the countryside through all the black neighborhoods as a threat to what might happen if, uh, if they tried to vote. Um, also, when it was voting day, it was a time of a uh, yellow fever epidemic. The famous one that really hit Memphis hard also was a problem in Phillips County. So under the pretext of quarantine, uh, many black voters were pinned up and not allowed to vote. One white planter in Helena, a guy named James Hanks, recorded in his diary, which is in uh, Fayetteville at the uh, University of Arkansas Special Collections. He said this about the election. He's not going to be sympathetic because he's a planter. He said, we have had an election so called. Any was permitted to vote the Democratic ticket. No one was permitted, permitted to vote any other. It's the first time in a long time that we've had the presence of the military overawing the c civil authorities. Well, under these kind of conditions, uh, a large number of black people, especially in Phillips County, decided they'd had it with uh, Arkansas, with Phillips County, and maybe even the United States, that it wasn't going to protect their interests. And we found um, you know, a good number of them deciding to leave to go to Li the Republic of Liberia. One of the ones who led the group was one of Blake's uh, 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 black legislators, Anthony Stanford, who was in the Senate, will lead a group. And they're pictured here in a New York newspaper uh, hanging out in a basement of a building in uh, New York City as they're waiting to be transported to Liberia. So again, political violence will continue and it will actually accelerate. In the 1880s, it's, there's going to be a sort of waxing and waning uh, pattern to some of this. Um, things got better for a while politically for uh, people of color, uh, but two factors in the mid to later 1880s are going to uh, bring out back the violence. One is going to be 
uh, a substantial migration of people of color into Arkansas that will upset the political balance, raise the uh, black percentage of, uh, in uh, many counties of Arkansas. You can see uh, this 1890 pattern that shows uh, more than a dozen black majority counties. And then in a number of other counties, the uh, percentage of African Americans who will be generally voting Republican went up to the point that uh, it could threaten control uh, by Democrats of their local offices. Second factor is going to be the rise of this agrarian populist movement uh, in the mid to later 1880s called the Agricultural Wheel. What was so threatening about the Agricultural Wheel is it was really basically poor folk, white and black, deciding to come together for common interest. You know, first economic interests like shutting out middlemen, uh, store owners, bankers, uh, railroad companies that were taking advantage, advantage of poor farmers uh, to, to have things like set up their own stores, their own cotton gins, their own mills and so forth. But they got political by the middle of the 1880s and began to run candidates for uh, public office. And this is pretty darn threatening. Uh, when the poor uh, began to pool their interests, black and white, together to threaten the control of the Democratic Party. And again, that's going to bring back the guns. As we get to the later 1880s, the elections 1888 and 1890 will be marred by uh, the same sort of fighting back and forth, voter intimidation. Um, in some cases, uh, the most famous case uh, the, I've made, tried to make famous, is what happened in uh, Conway County when uh, the guy that was running for Congress on the Republican side had almost all of his votes literally stolen when the, some masked Democrats showed up and just literally stole the ballot box at gunpoint. And then when he came up to Plummerville, this little town uh, where that happened, to try to reconstruct the stolen ballot, uh, he was assassinated. Um, also, there were election irregularities in one of the other um, congressional districts that caused both um, the guy who had won fraudulently to have his seat taken away, and then uh, he wasn't al alive to take his seat, but the Congress ruled that he had, in fact, won the election, and it was vacant. Um, his, the person that had taken it um, had to step aside. Uh, as there was beginning to be some federal scrutiny over um, elections uh, in Arkansas, and political violence used to, uh, to um, um, control and manage these elections. This is going to lead to, and it's already been alluded to today, uh, uh, attempts, successful attempts by politicians in Little Rock to change the rules, uh, ch election reform, uh, change the system uh, so that black people and poor whites uh, through, dis, uh, through uh, secret ballot legislation and poll tax legislation will not be voting in the numbers that they had before. So basically, uh, I'm going to make the argument that it wasn't until the uh, Republicans, uh, and you could even say poor whites and uh, people of color weren't going to be a threat to the control of the Democratic Party uh, in Arkansas that this um, uh, political violence ended. We're going to still have some violence. Uh, that's a little bit about the disfranchisement laws. Uh, and I would just point out again here in the late 1880s and early 1890s when this violence gets sharp again, we're going to find an, another uh, movement of people of color who've had it with life here in the United States and are looking for something better and go to uh, Liberia, as you see these folks from Arkansas doing uh, both leaving and then setting foot, first feet on uh, African soil. Uh, violence will continue. In fact, almost immediately after the disfranchisement laws, there's going to be a spate of really horrendous lynchings, some of them uh, spectacle lynchings. Where, you know, like, for example, I'll give you one, uh, Edward Coy in Texarkana, where more people showed up to watch him be lynched in spring of 1892 than live in this town of Texarkana, which means that people knew it was going to happen, came in from the countryside, uh, and it was a, such a brutal uh, event. Uh, I have a sanitized, uh, of relatively speaking, uh, photograph of an Arkansas link, lynching because the, there is a photograph that just recently surfaced uh, of the Edward Coy lynching, but it's so brutal uh, I wouldn't uh, 
what you you would it's R rated, you know, or, or even higher uh, for violence. Uh, but this kind of violence was not political, really, so much because the political situation had been uh, answered. It would be uh, a situation of more purely racial violence, just to remind people that their rights, you know, did not exist uh, in, as they had before. I'm going to stop there. I see I'm out of time. I had more to cover than I could uh, do in my allotted time, but I don't know if I have time for questions, but a couple. <laughs> yes. After the uh, martial law was over, uh -huh. was there any semblance of local law enforcement? Well, the um, Republican appointed people would continued in their office and enforce law. But you know what? I think what th we see is that the threat to the uh, their authority had been pretty much put aside by the uh, use of the militia that, that they could actually govern in life, political life restored in the counties. You know, after the the Klan pretty much went away. Uh, more so in Arkansas than in other states, you know, according to the scholars who've studied it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you referred to that uh, Robert Lynn Shaver. Uh-huh. Uh, was that the same Robert Shaver as Fighting Bob Shaver of Shiloh? Is that the same man? Is it? I wouldn't. I believe so. You know, okay. It is the same guy? I uh -huh. believe so. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Okay, thank you.